Let's get started, although people are still tuning in. So welcome everyone to Learn at Home, our virtual programming to continue sharing environmental issues with you and sharing key people's work and bringing in um, experts from various fields and just engaging you know, with, with you all. This has been really, really a great journey. If it's the first time that you're tuning in to Learn at Home, thank you so much. If you've been following us from the start of the pandemic, basically a year ago, thank you. We cannot do this uh, without all of your support. And we would also like to say thank you, a special thank you to our um, sponsors, seed funding provided by the Gene Albacon Senator Legacy Fund, and also Subaru, who sponsors our Learn at Home. So again, thank you all so much for tuning in. And before we get started, we also we want to say that our volunteer events are back and we are, you know, we are seeking volunteers. We need all of uh, our volunteers to help us do the work that we do, planting from the cities as well as in um, our you know, mountain restoration sites. So if you head to uh, treatpeople.org slash volunteer, and I can put that link in the chat, um, you can sign up and we hope to see you at our volunteer events. Yes, tree care summer. We need to be watering our plants so that they thrive and, and, and get big. All right. Um, so my name is Emmy and I am a uh, program coordinator at Tree People. I will be one of the moderators today alongside um, my coworker, Chris, who is also here. And today we're gonna be talking, uh, you know, we have a really, really special guest from the National Park Service. And we wanted to, um, just before we get started, we wanted to mention if if you are not native to LA, sometimes we get folks from tuning in from all over um, the country and even outside the US. So Tree People headquarters is on 45 acres of wildlands in Coldwater Canyon Park. And this is part of the Santa Monica Mountains. And we wanna take this moment to acknowledge that the land Tree People manages and conserves is on the ancestral lands of the Tongva, the Chumash, and the Tatavian people, who are the original stu stewards of this land. So we honor their elders, both past and present, for their continued connection to and protection of one of the most beautiful and diverse landscapes in the world. Oftentimes, you know, people are not aware of the full diversity of our ecosystem. So these lands are home to a huge diverse population of wildlife and serves as an important wildlife corridor. And in fact, these images that were taken from some of our wildlife cameras up at Tree People, um, we have caught pictures of uh, mule deer, here's a bobcat, uh, rabbits and coyotes and more. And so this is one of the reasons we are so, so excited today to welcome Dr. Seth Riley to, to learn more about this wildlife and specifically the carnivores of our area. So. Um, without further ado, I would like to introduce, introduce Dr. Seth Riley, who is the Wildlife Ecologist and Branch Chief for Wildlife at Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. Okay, thank you very much, Emmy, and thank you everyone uh, for coming, and I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, so here we go. So I'm going to talk today about work with wildlife and in particular with carnivores, as, as Emmy was saying. I'd like to start out with this slide showing some high quality wildlife habitat in the Santa Monica Mountains in the foreground here and downtown Los Angeles in the background. And as Emmy said, I work for the National Park Service and our job in all the national parks is to do our best to preserve the resources of those parks for future generations. And for me as a wildlife ecologist, that means the wildlife. But we have some different challenges in our park than you might have at Yosemite or Yellowstone or other places like that. And so all the work that we do, and I'm gonna talk specifically about carnivores, but we do work with birds and reptiles and amphibians and other things. And all the work that we do is focused on understanding what are the impacts of urbanization and fragmentation on wildlife populations and communities. 
it's an unusual national park too. A lot of people just don't even know there's a national park in Los Angeles. So Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area. It's 150,000 acres within the administrative boundary of the park, which is this dark green line here. Um, but there's actually only 25,000 acres of that is owned by the National Park Service. And then these darker green areas here are publicly owned open space. And, and even that is only about half the land within the boundary. So about 50% of it is still private. It's two different counties. It's many different cities, many, many different agencies. So it's a, it's a complicated situation in, in many ways, both uh, jurisdictionally as well as ecologically. So this is what it looks like here. And here we have the Santa Monica Mountains. And you can see there's lots of urbanization. So this is the San Fernando Valley here and uh, the Los Angeles Basin over here. And actually it's Coldwater Canyon that Emmy was just talking about is over here between 405 and the Hollywood Freeway. So you can see the Santa Monica's are surrounded by development. They're also surrounded by major freeways like 101, which I'll talk about. And then you have areas like this in the Simi Hills where you have little bits of open space surrounded by roads and development. And so that, fragment, that fragmentation is something that we're interested in and concerned about. So there are places like this, maybe many of you have been to them. You can go to the Santa Monica Mountains and have no idea that you're in Los Angeles, due to large open space areas, but then other spaces like this. So this is in the Agoura Hills area, Agoura Hills to Thousand Oaks, where you have these little fragments of open space surrounded by development, and then more roads and development on the other side, and then more bits of open space. And so it's a challenging, environment for all kinds of wildlife, but especially potentially for carnivores. So we started studying carnivores back in 1996. We've been studying them, at least some of them like bobcats for 25, more than 25 years now. And we started with, with carnivores because carnivores need a huge amount of space. And so if any group of wildlife is gonna be affected by the loss and fragmentation of habitat, carnivores are gonna be high on the list. And so we've been studying Carnivores, like I said, going back to 1996, so more than 25 years now. And the overall goal is to understand how are they living in this urban and fragmented landscape. And specifically, we're studying various aspects of their ecology and behavior to understand how are they affected by, by development and fragmentation. So things like urban association, how much are animals using urban areas like this bobcat here outside our office in Thousand Oaks uh, versus natural areas versus areas in between. How big are their home ranges? How are they moving across the landscape? Importantly, what are corridors for movement and what are barriers? How well are they surviving? And when they don't survive, what are they dying from? What are they eating? Are they able to disperse? Are they able to reproduce? And then how are they affected by disease and toxicants? And I'll talk at least a little bit about some of these things for, for three species today, coyotes, bobcats, and mountain lions. So starting with coyotes, coyotes are sort of the quintessential urban carnivore in many places, I would say, including in California, they're famous for making it in urban areas. But unfortunately, I shall say that in Los Angeles is one of the oldest populations of urban coyotes probably, and there's probably been coyotes or, or there have definitely been coyotes as long as there's been Los Angeles. Um, but a lot of information that you see is things like this, like unfortunately, this is really the the one and only case, but there was a child killed in Glendale in the early 80s, or you get there was a report a number of years ago of Jessica Simpson's dog being killed by coyotes, or you get these reports about coyote-human interactions and bites and things. And these are all things that appear in the media, and they're really basically anecdotal information. They're not providing actual scientific investigation into the behavior and ecology of coyotes. And so that's what we wanted to do with our with our work in general and with our work on coyotes in particular. So we studied coyotes intensively for nine years from 96 to 2004. We caught 130 and collared 110 of them. This is in the Simi Hills and Northern Santa Monica Mountains, our sort of core study area for, especially for bobcats and initially for coyotes. Um, so park areas and it's a relatively, somewhat of a suburban landscape, I would say. So one of the things we're interested in with all these species, as I said, is how are they using the landscape? How urban associated are they? So here you have how we characterize the landscape and some of, some of these studies, the dark green is natural, the gray is urban. And then we use this other category, this light green that we call altered open areas. So that means things like golf courses and low density gated communities and like the Calabasas landfill here, things that are not exactly all pavement, but they're not exactly natural either. So here's 
places in the same hills where you have large natural areas far from development. And then this is some of those in between areas, like altered open areas, like this is the Calabasas landfill here. And this is one of these gated communities, the North Ranch community, where you have low density development and bits of vegetation and natural area in between, um, but it's not exactly like you're in the middle of the park there. So what have, what have we learned about coyotes? This is from that, those first nine years when we were studying them early on there. And what this is, is we were collaring the animals and radio tracking them. And so this is the percent of development, the percent of altered open areas and the percent of natural in their home ranges and also of their locations. And you can see even for coyotes, which you, can, you think of as being potentially relatively urban, two thirds of their home ranges were in natural areas and three quarters of their points were in natural areas. So they do sometimes use urban areas or these altered areas, but they're still really focused and heavily using these natural areas. So here's an example in the Oak Park area. And you can see these green points are coyote points. And you can see real, there's, there's quite a, an urban landscape overall, lots of residential areas, but the coyotes are finding these little bits, these stream courses and these little bits of natural area in between. Um, this is a, a favorite example from early on in the study when I first was here and I came in 2000 and we were following this coyote was actually collared before I came out in the park actually in the Simi Hills, but she dispersed out into the middle of the San Fernando Valley. So you can see this is a pretty intensely urban area and we would go out and track her every time that we went out at night, which was every week and we would generally find her at the Sepulveda Basin over here, which is again not exactly natural, but there's at least some vegetated areas and right by the dam here, it's a little more natural, or she was over at Pierce College. So she was finding what was at, at least somewhat close to being vegetated and natural as, or as close as you could find in the San Fernando Valley. And so if you look at her home range here and say, how much is it developed? It's 75%. But if you look at her locations, they were only 7.5% developed. And then sort of interesting to note too, Pierce College, um, had certainly had then and may still have a sheep demonstration area. Uh, so that was certainly something that was potentially drawing in her and, and other coyotes as well. This is another example in the Thousand Oaks area of an adult male coyote. You can see that we were following and his points were almost entirely, this is where our office is, which is a natural patch in these little natural areas. And so his home range overall was 78% developed, but his locations only 15%. So overall, coyotes really using natural areas as, as much as they can, even in some pretty urban areas. Um, and then we're also interested in diet for coyotes. So we walk these trails and we walk fire roads and we pick up scat, which is just another way of, of saying poop for carnivores. And this is the this is a, a diet study that we did early on um, in the study. So 2002 or 2004 in that more urban area in the Simi Hills. Um, and this is frequency of occurrence. So what that means is this is the percent of the, of the scats that we looked at. And we looked both in fragment areas and in core areas that contain these different items. And so one thing to notice is this list is very long. So coyotes are omnivorous. They eat lots of different things. And actually, especially in the dry season, the most common item to find in their scats is fruit, both in the fragments and in the cores. And then roots are important. But a few items that we were especially interested in down at the bottom here are items that are more associated with people. Um, so, I'm sorry. Um, so things like trash and domestic cats and pet food. And you can see that relatively low percentage, they certainly eat them, um, but it's, it's not a high percentage, especially the cats one or, one or 2%. Um, so this is looking just at those anthropogenic items, excluding fruit, which I'll get to in a second. And again, you can see this is the percent occurrence, so the percent of all the items that we found that were these different things. And you can see domestic cats were very low, dog food also low, less than 10%, trash a little bit higher, but still a small percentage of the diet. And so does that mean that cats, uh, that coyotes don't eat, kill and eat domestic cats? No, it definitely doesn't. Uh, they, they certainly do that. And actually, at least in our area, we rarely see domestic cats in the natural areas. And we think that's because of coyotes. Um, and is that not a big deal? I mean, obviously, if that's your cat, then, then it is a very big deal. But what, what that means is the coyotes, at least in this study that we were doing, were not focused on and heavily using 
they really weren't relying on things like um, domestic cats as, as to keep them going. But one thing that was interesting is to look at fruit, which is something that's specific to, to Southern California. You have a lot of fruit that people plant, ornamental fruit. And if you think of that as an anthropogenic food item, so a human related food item, that that was actually more like 20% of the food items. And so if you put that together with the, the pet food, the trash and the cats, up to a quarter of the diet in, the, in that area was related to people. The other thing that I think it's important to realize is we followed 110 coyotes for nine years. And as far as we know, and I think we would know since they were collared, none of those coyotes ever became nuisance animals or threatened people during that time. So does that mean that that never happens, that coyotes never become nuisances or, or bite people or, or get into problems? No, obviously it does occur and we hear about it in the press, but what that means is the vast majority of the coyotes out there are, are not getting into those conflicts with people. Briefly about some work we've done more recently in the last few years, um, and it's coyote kind of study, we haven't been able to do it, a lot of it, but it's been really interesting to follow coyotes right in Los Angeles. Um, and so this is that study area where we were doing coyotes before and, and doing bobcats um, in the Simi Hills and the Northern Santa Monica Mountains, but we were actually doing this more recent coyote work right in downtown. So there's a couple of coyotes with downtown uh, in the background and it's pretty amazing to see where some of these coyotes are. So these are GPS points from GPS collars for a bunch of different coyotes and you can see 144 here. She actually raised five pups in this area which is really pretty amazing. This is where her points were again right next to downtown and it's just amazing to think of a coyote, a family of coyotes in these places doesn't seem like decent wildlife habitat but she was finding little backyards and hillsides and bits of open space here and there um, that, that she was using. And then this is another example, uh, this coyote using uh, the Los Angeles River here um, and going back and forth along the river corridor there. And actually, so Justin Brown, who was our biologist doing that work, would go out sometimes and follow, follow the coyotes and actually see what they were doing. And you can see here's the coyote going by domestic dog here, not really being too concerned. Um, you know, one thing we're interested in, as I said, is diet and what's going on with domestic cats. This is a remote camera photo that we had of a, a, of a domestic cat, obviously in this case with a bird. Um, but then we got a photo in that similar spot of, a, of a, one of our collared coyotes uh, getting a cat. So we, we do see that obviously that, that is something that's, that's occurring, as I said. Um, but it's certainly not a happening every time. So Justin had a couple nights of tracking 144. He saw her walking by 16 different cats. Uh, she gave a short pursuit of one, but one cat chased her after she walked by a car it was under. And then there was another one laying in the middle of the roadway that she walked around a couple of times. So um, there's a sort of a variety of different interactions that go on between, uh, between coyotes and domestic animals. And then this is Coyote 144. Um, she figured out how to navigate this street downtown, which is uh, actually a, a pretty important street for, unfortunately, for pedestrians being injured, but she was able to figure that out. Um, and the last thing about that, this urban Los Angeles Coyote work is we did some more scat work actually right in downtown. And actually that was heavily volunteer oriented. So we had volunteers picking up the scat and also Justin held these bi-weekly scat parties where people came and analyzed the scat. It was amazing. Um, the assistance we got, there was 20 to 23 different sites in Los Angeles there. And then we also did it back in the same places that we had done this previous study back in the early 2000s. These are some of these sites and you can see, so here's downtown and some of these sites are, are very urban. Um, and again, we're interested in native species and, and more human related species. And so it was interesting to see the diet in these, in these really urban areas. So these uh, darker colored bars here are the more suburban, like where we did before. And these lighter ones are the urban. And so you can see rabbits are much more important in the diet out in that suburban area, not surprisingly. And then domestic cats quite a bit higher in those downtown Los Angeles areas, cats and trash, but still, only about 10, less than 15% of the items. Um, so, so not, you know, not totally dominating the diet even, even downtown. So we've also been studying bobcats going back to 96. Um, so for 25 years now, and this is a picture of a bobcat 
sort of if people haven't seen them much, they have the short tail, though it's important to realize they do still have a tail. Often people think they, they have no tail, tail and they think it's something else, as I'll talk about in a little bit. And they have ear tufts, which are a little hard to see, and then this really cool facial ruff, and then they can be pretty spotted like this guy. So this is urban associ association data from the first five years of our bobcat study. You know, and it's interesting, bobcats are different. First of all, they're pure carnivores as opposed to coyotes. Um, but also they're pretty different between the sexes. So the males are quite a bit bigger than the females, same as in mountain lions. And we saw a difference in terms of how they're using the landscape too. So here you have the percentage of the points that were urban, altered and natural and the percentage of the home range. And so here you can see adult males and adult females. And you can see the males were a lot more urban associated than the females, uh, both in terms of their points and in terms of their home range. And this is what that, that looks like on the landscape. So these blue home ranges and points are for females and you can see they're really heavily staying within the natural areas, whereas these orange ones are males. So they're bigger, as I said, and they're overlapping with the urban areas more so. And, and so why does that matter? That matters because in, in bobcats, as in most mammals, the females do all the taking care of the offspring. And so if you're concerned about the population and worried about reproduction occurring, you need areas that are suitable for females. So here's another Example, more recently with a GPS collar, and here's a, a female bobcat next to 101 here, and you can see she's never going into the urban areas and not even really using the Calabasas landfill here, that one of those altered open areas. One of the things that's interesting with bobcats to think about is um, we think of about species like coyotes that I just mentioned as being urban exploiters, also raccoons, where they can have higher density in urban areas and take advantage of those things like I was talking about with trash and domestic species potentially. And then on the other end, we think of things like mountain lions as being urban avoiders that mostly avoid, especially highly urban areas. But we think of bobcats as potentially being something in between. We call them potentially urban tolerant. So here, here's the urban exploiters that have higher abundance in urban areas. And then the urban avoiders like lions that are almost never really in the suburban areas, but the bobcats are maybe a little more tolerant. So they're maybe not exploiting to the same extent that coyotes and raccoons do, but they're they're tolerating these urban areas. But we, we had some evidence that we think maybe they're even getting some extra benefit in a certain way through their prey species. So this is from that same early diet study in the early 2000s with bobcats. One thing to notice is this list is much shorter with bobcats than with coyotes because they're not eating insects and trash and uh, fruit especially, right, because they're not omnivorous, they're strict carnivores. And you can see rabbits really dominate the diet, both in the fragmented areas and both, well, both in the wet and the dry season. And it's not on here, but both in fragmented core areas. So about 60% of, um, of the diet for bobcats is rabbits. And we did some work with a grad student at Cal State Northridge, Sean Dunnigan, where he went out and collected some actual data on rabbits in our traditional Simi Hill study area here. So he did visual transects and he did pellet counts. But he, what he found, especially with the VIX, is that, that the, the rabbits were really throughout the landscape. They were in the urban areas and the natural areas and along the urban edge like this rabbit here. So they were really throughout the landscape. And then he did this analysis called resource selection. And I'll talk about this again with mountain lions where we were asking, okay, where are the bobcats going relative to what's available to them? And so if they use a particular part of the landscape more than it's available, then that means they're selecting it. And if they use it less, that means they're avoiding it. And so what he found was a big difference between daytime and nighttime. Um, so these white areas are areas they were selecting. And during the day, they were really selecting the natural areas and avoiding the development. But at nighttime, that was switched and they were selecting the, the urban areas much more. And we think that's basically because they're going after rabbits that are abundant throughout the landscape in both urban areas and on the urban edge. And so what we think may be going on is sort of an interesting situation potentially with bobcats. So we think of coyotes and raccoons, they're getting what we think of as a primary urban resource subsidy. So these omnivores, they're getting trash and ornamental fruit and uh, maybe pets. And so they're benefiting in that way. There's a picture of raccoons there. The bobcats and the mountain lions are strict carnivores. So they're not eating those kinds of things, but 
if things like rabbits and deer are benefiting from potentially from the lush irrigated vegetation, especially in dry areas like Southern California, then things like bobcats and mountain lions may be benefiting from a secondary urban resource subsidy. In other words, they're benefiting because their prey may be more abundant and then they're uh, benefiting from that abundant prey. One thing that we've been looking at with bobcats is reproduction. Um, so this is actually a point from tracking a bobcat and you can see at certain times of the, the year and they're very seasonal with bobcats, you have many points right in the same area. And so then we can go in and check that spot out. And here you can see bobcat kittens here. Um, and if I, if I could go back and forth, I would ask if people had an idea about what this, uh, this den site is, but this is actually a wood rat nest and actually a lot of the bobcat dens that we find are in these wood rat nests. And this is one of my favorite pictures that shows you how the bobcat feels about our study here. So, um, but one thing I just wanted to mention just recently, just last month, actually, uh, the bobcats have been having some challenges the last couple of years. Um, but we had a, the first litter in the last couple of years that we found. So this is bobcats 370, 380, and 381. And interestingly, they were actually in an oak tree here in an oak tree limb. So after the fire, which I don't have time to talk about it um, today, but the fire had a big impact on habitat for certainly for bobcats and lions um, and reduced the denning habitat. But in this case, the, the fire may have created this, uh, this cavity in the tree um, that the bobcats denned in. So what's happening with reproduction across the landscape? We're interested to see our bobcat producing both in the fragmented areas and in the more natural areas. And the answer is yes. This is for the first 10 years or so of the study. So about two thirds of the females were reproducing in both part of, parts of the landscape there. Um, but now you go all the way through 2014 and we saw an interesting pattern there and we're concerned that we could see something similar recently. So you can see up through 2011 for those first 16 years that on average, again, it was about two thirds of the females that were reproducing, but in the three years, 2012, 13, and 14, it was 7% and two of the years, none of our females reproduced. And if you remember, that was the beginning of a really historic drought in Southern California. And so we think that that may be affecting, could have been affecting rabbit populations and then affecting the bobcats. Um, so an important thing, as I mentioned at the beginning, is what are barriers to movement and what are corridors for, mo for movement? And that's something we're interested in with all of these different species. You know, obviously we have big roads and lots of traffic in Southern California. So we've seen that the major roads like 101 are significant barriers to movement. So these are home ranges for coyotes early on in the study. This is over many years, so these aren't all at the same time. But you can see these home ranges are right up against the freeway on the north side or on the south side, but generally not across it. And then same thing for bobcats in the early years. This is the Liberty Canyon area here, actually. Um, and home ranges up against the freeway, but basically not across it. And then this is a more recent GPS collared bobcat. And you can see lots of points right up to the freeway, but not across. And in fact, in this case, he didn't, he didn't even cross uh, Las Virginis as well, a major secondary road. So we, we know that the freeways are a barrier to movement, but are they enough of a barrier to actually create genetic changes across the freeway and so we take um, blood samples and other samples whenever we catch and handle the animals and so we we're interested to know do we see genetic differences across the freeway more of a difference across the freeway say than along the freeway and we found that that was in fact the case so for bobcats this is these numbers are uh, fst which is a measure of genetic differentiation and you can see there's twice as much genetic differentiation across the freeway here as there is along the freeway uh, we saw that for bobcats and we also saw it for coyotes. Another way that we measure, and I just want to mention this because I'm going to come back to it with mountain lions. Another way that we measure genetic differentiation is using this program called Structure. So these are structure results for bobcats where we put all our genetic data into the program and we ask it how many different genetic clusters are there. So in this case, there were four clusters. So this cluster was actually from my dissertation work all the way up in Marin County. So, so that one, it's good that that one is very different. There are all those animals were in this yellow cluster. Um, but then all the animals in Southern Cal uh, south of 101 were mostly in this red cluster here. And then the animals in the Northwest area and the Northeast area were a mix of this blue and green cluster. So similar to the other results that we saw. And, and then interestingly, 
these animals, so these are animals that belonged in the red cluster, but were north of the freeway. But actually, we knew from radio tracking that a number of those animals actually lived close to or even crossed the freeway. So they were sort of exceptions uh, that proved the rule. We saw the same difference, actually even stronger with coyotes. So close to 10 times as much genetic differentiation across the freeway than along the freeway in coyotes. And then I had a grad student at UCLA, actually, who expanded this bobcat genetic work out um, all the way to 2012 and actually across more areas across the Santa Monica's and she still saw a big difference north. So these red and green clusters are north of the freeway versus south of the freeway, but also we saw a big difference relative to another freeway. So this is west of 405 and these ones are east of 405. And so this uh, DEST is a similar measure to FST. Again, significant genetic differentiation across the freeway, across 101, but also across 405, which was interesting. So I'll talk a little bit about survival and mortality now. Um, this is a coyote hit on the road. I'm not gonna talk too much about that, although that's a major source of mortality. I just wanna warn you this next slide is uh, my, my bloodiest slide, um, but just to, it'll show you sort of some of the things that we're seeing. So one of the things that we've been seeing is a huge amount of exposure and impacts from certain toxicants, specifically anticoagulant rodenticides that people put out um, to, to rodents and they end up in the wildlife. So this is a coyote you can see here. Uh, he died, he didn't die here. This is when we brought him back to necropsy him. He died out in the middle of the park, just laying there, um, no signs of trauma, no major injuries. And when we opened him up, um, he was full of free blood and he had, he had bled to death. Um, and so actually we saw that 83% of the coyotes that we tested in that early coyote study had died from or were exposed to these anticoagulant rodenticides. And it, after being hit by vehicles, it was the second most important cause of mortality in our coyotes. So it definitely was affecting the coyotes. Interestingly, with bobcats, the story is a little bit different. So with bobcats starting in the early 2000s, we started to see a bunch of mortality from disease, specifically from this disease called notoedric mange. We had never seen it before in the first six years or so. And you can see they get all crusty on the face, especially, and then they get emaciated and eventually die. Disease is caused by this mite here. And the mange episodic had a big impact on the population. So the survival rate, so the survival rate, these numbers mean what's the chance of a bobcat surviving from one year to the next in 97, 98, et cetera. And you can see the survival rates for these first five years were very high, about 75%. But then the mange death started to happen in 2002, one in 2001, and then 2002 and three, survival rate dropped down to 50% and then down to 30% in just a couple of years. This is a, one of those fragments of habitat that we study in the Gura Hills area. We had six bobcats we were tracking there and five of those six died of mange and the sixth one we lost track of. So a big impact. And here you can see the number of scats we were collecting out there and a huge drop off when the mange deaths increased there. Um, so why was all this mange happening? Well, the first few animals that we took in to get necropsied by the state lab, we had them just do everything because we hadn't seen this before. And all of those animals had been exposed to those same anticoagulant rodenticides um, that the coyotes were dying from. And so they actually suggested to us, maybe there's an interaction where if the bobcats are exposed to this toxicant that could make them more susceptible to dying from mange. And we certainly saw that in a, in a numerical way. So this is through the first, um, what, 12, 13 years of the study. But you can see, so of the animals that died of mange, 22 out of 26 had at least 0.05 parts per million of these, of these anticoagulants, whereas of the ones that, that didn't, um, just nine of 12 had that level. So, and this was a highly significant result. So other animals can, uh, that don't die of mange certainly can be exposed too, but there was a, a strong association between dying of mange and being exposed to these rodenticides. And so actually that same graduate student did some work and specifically looked at immune function in bobcats that were exposed to rodenticides versus ones that weren't. And she found that there was significant inflammation in uh, in bobcats that were exposed and also some immune suppression as well. So just a lot of stuff going on with the immune system in those bobcats. Um, and one of the things that we think may be going on, she looked at cytokines, which are cell signaling proteins, which are really important in terms of focusing the immune system on a particular type of 
disease. And so we think what might be going on is a lot of these cytokines were significantly increased in terms of how much they were expressed in bobcats that were exposed that were versus ones that were not exposed. And so if the cytokines are helping the immune system focus in on a particular disease, if lots of different cytokines are expressed, then maybe it's harder for the, the immune system to focus on it. Um, and then I'll just say we have a huge amount of exposure in the bobcats too. So this is 92% um, of our bobcats that we tested through 2017 were exposed and 83% of them to multiple compounds. Um, and I'll just say that we, we had a big decline in the, in the bobcats during that period. As I was saying, this is that same patch that I was talking about um, after mange. We had the bobcats sort of come back in the around 2009-10. Um, but actually in recent years, we've been seeing a bit more mange, which, which is a bummer. So over these couple of years, we had relatively low survival and nine of the bobcats with known mortality cause, six of them were mange. So it seems to definitely still be around in the population and potentially affecting animals. But now I wanna talk about mountain lions. Um, and I like to start with this <laughs> picture. Um, and so that everyone knows that this is a mountain lion uh, and this is not. It seems obvious here, but actually often, you know, it can be confusing and a lot of people don't even know that bobcats are around and but the mountain lions have a, a really long tail here and they aren't spotted like the, like the bobcats. Uh, and they're bigger, but you know, size can obviously be a thing that's, that's difficult to see sometimes or difficult to assess. So we've been studying bobcats, uh, sorry, mountain lions since 2002, wave, a, a lot fewer than the than the bobcats, so where we're close to 400. But that's because mountain lions are large carnivores. This is our most famous mountain lion, P22, with the Hollywood sign in the back here. Mountain lions are large carnivores, and so I often think of them. They're the last large carnivore in the Santa Monicas. I think of them as sort of the ultimate challenge for conservation in a landscape like ours. So remember, the the main study area for the bobcats and coyotes was right in here. But this entire area, the Santa Monica's, the Simi Hills, the Santa Susana, all the way up to Los Padres is our a study area for mountain lions. And we assumed from the very beginning of our studies with lions that probably the Santa Monica Mountains were not going to be big enough for a viable population of mountain lions. And, and that's what we've seen, actually. Um, so this is a home ranges from a few of the first mountain lions that we saw. This is P1, the first lion that we tracked. And you can see his home range encompasses the entire Santa Monica's from Point Magoo State Park all the way out to Topanga State Park. And that's not an outrageously big home range for a mountain lion. And then you can see here's the female, like, like with bobcats, females use smaller areas. So this is our first female P2. And you can imagine maybe there's room for another female in the west and another female in the east. And sometimes females, we've been seeing this too, will overlap with their close relatives, you know, mothers and daughters, for example. So maybe you have room for six females and maybe sometimes you have two males instead of one. You're still talking about 10 or so animals in the Santa Monica's and that's just not enough in the long run um, dem demographically or genetically. And then as I said, the, the home ranges are really big. So this is just showing some of the home ranges. This is the animals we were tracking uh, in 2016. You can see again, some of these males using almost the entire or huge chunks of the Santa Monica's and even the females like this one using large areas. We have a couple of animals here that I'll talk a lot about more that are really of interest, P41 that we followed in the Verdugos and then P22 in the Griffith Park area who had very small home ranges. And in fact, 22 has the smallest home range that we've ever seen documented anywhere um, in the world for an, for an adult male mountain lion. So we're interested with the mountain lions too and how are they using the landscape just like we talked about with the bobcats and coyotes. So we have lots of different points. This is for P45 here. So we're interested to know to what extent are they using urban areas versus natural areas. And actually with the lions here, we were looking at habitat types too. So coastal sage scrub, chaparral, uh, riparian woodland, upland woodland, et cetera. Um, and you do have occasional points. So this is an early lion that we were following in the Simi Hills here in the Thousand Oaks area. Here you can see a point along the stream here near the golf course. And actually this one is even at two in the afternoon. Uh, as far as we know, no one had any idea that P3 was here. So, so those do happen and sometimes they get attention. But what we've seen, we did this big analysis for the first 14 years or so, 13 or 14 years of the study. And we found that the truth is mountain lions are extremely rarely in urban areas. So this is many thousands of points. 
Um, and with all animals all together, you can see 1%, less than 1% of their points were urban and 96.5% of their points were, were natural area. Um, and this is true for all different, for males and females and subadults. Um, the one couple of animals that were different that I'll, I'll talk about a little bit more were P22 and P41, 7.5% on average of their points were urban. But, but even for those two, our most urban animals, 90% of their points uh, were in natural areas. And we see the same thing with, with home range composition. So again, very low percentage of the home ranges, only 1.8% urban for all animals overall. And so 91% natural for their home ranges. Although, although again, a little bit more urban um, for P22 and, and P41. So we did these resource selection analyses with mountain lions too, and that was really interesting. So the, again, we're looking at what do the animals do versus what's available. And so in this, in this case, we put a bunch of random points out and we said, what's the difference between those, the distance between those random points and say urban or chaparral or something and the actual points that the mountain lions use. And so if the distance is less, say to chaparral for the, for the points that the lions used, then you have a negative number here and that means they're selecting it. Um, and you can see, so this is for adult males, they strongly selected chaparral and then they avoided uh, grassland. And one of the things that was really interesting with this analysis is we saw a pretty different story than we saw with the, the use. So remember, mountain lions were very rarely in urban areas, but they were in this distance resource selection analysis, they were selecting them. In other words, they were closer to them than you would expect by chance. And that was true for a little bit less for adult males, but, but for all four sex cl age classes, they were significantly selecting developed areas. And then interestingly, they were strongly avoiding those altered open areas. So golf courses and cemeteries and things like that. So this is what that looks like on the landscape. So here's P42, an adult female, and you can see all of her points here. This is the Palisades area. Actually, this is where that uh, we've been having the fire just, just this last week. And you can see she's um, essentially never in the urban areas, but she's right up against them in some of these places. So she's closer to them than you might expect. And we think again, that maybe that's related to if deer are benefiting from urban areas or close to urban areas, then maybe the mountain lions because deer are really their main prey, um, then that may be what's going on there. And then here's P22 in the Griffith Park area. And you can see with him, the really strong avoidance of these altered open areas. So this is purple is altered open areas. So this is Forest Lawn Cemetery and the golf course here and the landfill. And you can see he's virtually never in them. So here's Forest Lawn and he did go through this little stream course that goes through the cemetery, but virtually never on the actual cemetery areas themselves. Um, and then what's really interesting to look at 22 and P41 who were our most urban mountain lions, as I mentioned, P22 and 41 were in urban areas more than the other lions. And so here you can see some points for P22 in these urban areas um, south of Griffith Park there. Um, but interestingly, if you zoom in on where was he actually going, like there's a point there, you can see the houses, many of you may know that's houses along the ridge and then these relatively natural areas in between. And so he was typically in these little uh, natural areas, kind of like the, finding these little bits of, of vegetation in between uh, the residential areas. But P41, probably in some ways our most urban animal that we followed, you can see here's his points in the Burbank area. So again, you know, most of his points are in the Verdugo Hills here, Verdugo Mountains, but some of these points were out into Burbank in some pretty intensely de developed areas. They were always in the middle of the night. So 1, 2 a.m. So he wasn't doing those, that during the day. Here you can see that with the aerial there. Um, and what was he doing out there? Well, potentially getting some smaller prey, things like this is a domestic cat here, uh, and this is a raccoon here, and there's a picture that somebody got of P41. Um, on their on their patio there. So what about connectivity with mountain lions? That's really a critical thing, especially with mountain lions. Uh, and there are some, that, well, one freeway in particular, 118, between the Seam Hills and the Santa Susanas, where we had a fair amount of mountain lion crossing that freeway. We had two animals early in the study, P3 and P4, that went back and forth a number of times, um, and in particular P3. But there is a nice crossing spot there. There's this hiker equestrian tunnel there. You can see P3 with his collar and the graffiti on the base, uh, base of the tunnel there. So we, we think he went back and forth there every time. But for the other freeways, and in particular, the most important freeway 101, 
we see very little movement. This is a mountain lion early in the study that got up close to the freeway P2 and then she turned around and went back. And this is actually the Liberty Canyon area that I'll mention again in a minute where she was coming close to the freeway. And this is what that looks like. In order to get across there, you'd have to come down and navigate around this office building and go under Liberty Canyon Road here. So we're hoping to, to make a change with that. So what are mountain lions doing? Are they crossing the freeways? Um, as I said, very rarely with 101 and with 405 actually. So here's lots of many thousands of points for the lions. And you can see at the west end, right up to the freeway and not getting across, same in the cent center of the mountains and at the east end along the San Fernando Valley, they're not even getting close to the freeway. Um, and so what does that mean? We have very low dispersal out of the Santa Monica's and that leads to increased interactions between young animals. So typically in mountain lion populations, all the young males and even half the young females typically disperse. Whereas um, in our area, we see very little effective dispersal because the animals can't get back, they can't get out of the Santa Monica's basically. And then we also see very little dispersal into the Santa Monica's with one exception, which I'll talk about a little bit. Um, and so we have some consequences of both of those things. So with the just lack of dispersal out of the Santa Monica's, especially with young males, for example, we don't know basically of any young males in the Santa Monica's that have successfully dispersed to a new home range somewhere else. A um, couple, couple have, have tried and gotten close, but frequently they end up dying. Um, so the 18 where we know what happened to them, 14 died before or during dispersal, sometimes on roads. Um, this one in Santa Monica actually was, was killed by police, but the most common mortality source for these young males was they're getting into fights with adult males, often that they're not able to potentially escape from them and then they're getting killed in these fights. Um, and so we think that's one of the consequences of the fact that you can't, that the animals are not able to burst back and forth across one one. The other thing that we're seeing is very close, inter, very close or mating between very close relatives. Um, so for example, we had this adult male P12 and he mated with a female P13 and had this litter of kittens 17, 18 and 19. But then later he mated with P19, his daughter and had 23 and 24. And then he later mated with 23 and had 36 and 37. And so for 36 and 37, P12 is the father and the grandfather and the great grandfather. Um, and they don't know that they're just out there trying to mate with whoever they can, they can run into. But because animals aren't able to disperse back and forth, we think it's more likely that those very close inbreeding events are occurring and that's bad for genetic diversity. Um, so this is that same program structure with the mountain lions and you can see animals south of the freeway in the Santa Monica's are very strongly in this green cluster. And then animals to the north are in this blue cluster and actually east of five are in this red cluster. So green in the Santa Monica's blue to the north and red to the east. And we've actually seen very low genetic diversity in the Santa Monica's relative to north of 101. So these are different measures of genetic diversity. This is work we're doing with colleagues at University of Wyoming and UCLA. And you can see significantly higher genetic diversity north of the freeway than south. And in fact, in the Santa Monica's, similar to in the Santa Ana's actually down in Orange County, which is also a, a fragmented nation surrounded by roads and development, we see very low genetic diversity, lower than anywhere else in the state and lower than anywhere else across the West, actually. Only Florida Panthers had um, as low genetic diversity um, or lower actually than, than our two populations. Um, I need to sort of wrap up here pretty soon, but I'll just say we did have a young male P12 dispersed into the Santa Monica's in early 2009, dispersed right in the Liberty Canyon area. And these are the offspring from P12 and P13 and P23. And you can see they're a nice mix of that green cluster in the Santa Monica's from P13. And then P12 was this blue cluster here. And so we got some new genetic material into the population, which was good news. And the truth is this is some population modeling that we did with a, a postdoc at UCLA. And we found that the truth is the population without immigration in some serious trouble. So this is heterozygosity, a measure of genetic diversity. And John modeled it with some different scenarios, no immigration, the similar to what we'd seen. But then if you increase immigration just a little bit to one every four years or maybe one every two years, 
that genetic diversity doesn't keep declining as much and stays higher here. And in particular, it stays above this level, this red level, which is what the genetic diversity was in the Florida Panthers. One very recent thing I just wanted to mention though that was unfortunate is we have started to see just in the last year, we caught P81, a young male who was healthy, but he had a distinct kink at the end of his tail here, as you can see. And this is a sign of low genetic diversity and inbreeding depression that they were seeing in Florida. He also had only one of his testes was descended. The other one was undescended. And these are exactly the same kind of def defects that they were seeing in Florida Panthers before they were rescued by some, some mountain lions from Texas. So they had 90% of those kink tails and two thirds of the males uh, had this issue with their testes. And we have seen this, there's a photo of P81, but we saw another male in the same area right afterwards. And then we've actually seen a male over in the Eastern Santa Monica's in the area um, where, where tree people is centered that also had this tail kink. And so it's something, something that we're concerned about. So what are we doing about that? We're actually working on making a crossing, a very ambitious, exciting project uh, that just had a big announcement actually late last week about um, where we're working with Caltrans and, and National Wildlife Federation is doing the funding and lots of other folks, Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and Resource Cons Conservation District to try to build a wildlife overpass like you can see here at Banff and, um, and here's one in Germany where they've done in other parts of the world a lot more of these things than we have so far. Um, and we're gonna put this wildlife overpass to increase connectivity for mountain lions and for everything else um, across 101. One thing to notice here is a couple of things about these roads. You can see this road, not very wide and no cars. So one thing that's different about our project, it's gonna be over 10 lanes of freeway, eight lanes of traffic, um, and one of the busiest highways in the world, 350,000 cars a day. Um, and in an urban area, none of these have, have gone into urban areas that, we've, that we know of in the past. So it's, so it's a unique project, but, but pretty exciting. Um, and then I should wrap up here so we can get to questions, but I just want to say one last thing about the lions is we have seen a lot of exposure to anticoagulant rodenticides in mountain lions as well. Um, and we think the way that's happening is it's getting into the coyotes and, and other carnivores, like I said, and though mountain lions mostly eat deer, they sometimes eat coyotes. And so that's, we think how the lions are getting it. Um, this is through 2015 and every one of the mountain lions we had tested at that point, except for one, were exposed to multiple compounds. Even this, this three month old kitten was exposed. And then we continue to see that in more recent years um, and up to six different compounds they're getting exposed to. And then we're seeing some of these mountain lions die from the bleeding to death. Like this is P47 here, just like the coyotes. And then even more recently, we've, in the last couple of years, we've still seen more of this. This is a young male that died in the Santa Susanas, an adult male that died in Topanga State Park. Um, and so, Currently, the total is 27 of the 27 lions that we've tested um, have been exposed to these, these rodenticides. So I'll just skip to my last slide here, which is just talking a little bit about what can, what can we potentially do? Because um, I wanted to just mention that a little bit. And you know, I think one of the things that's really valuable is to help educate everyone about wildlife um, you know, from some of the things that hopefully you've learned today. So. For example, these animals use huge areas, the mountain lion, the coyote, and the bobcat don't live in your backyard. Um, I didn't get a chance to, to mention this specifically, but fortunately, one of the things that's going on with the lions is we've studied now 96 lions over 19 years, and not a single one, knock on wood, has ever behaved aggressively towards people. So it's pretty clear that mountain lions don't think of people as prey, um, and that's critical because we wouldn't still have mountain lions in any of these areas if they did. Um, don't use toxicants if you can possibly avoid it, like these rodenticides, because the things that affect carnivores and raptors and other wildlife. Do protect domestic animals, your pet cats and dogs, from coyotes certainly, um, but also things like sheep, goats, and llamas by keeping them in, inside or in enclosed areas at night. And then support connectivity as much as you can for wildlife at every level, like with big projects like the crossing, um, but even just down to things like plant, planting native species and not having too many walls and fencing to allow animals to move through your neighborhood. So that's it, I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Wow, this was 
pretty fantastic. <laughs> I learned something today. Um, I do want to jump in. We had um, some questions for you. Uh, we were asked, have you done any location analysis since quarantine lockdown? Uh, if so, have they increased their areas since there were fewer people out? Right, so that's an excellent question. And there, there was, everyone probably knows that there was lots of discussion, especially right, right, right about a year ago or so about, oh, there's all kinds of animals, you know, descending into the urban areas and, um, you know, and. And I certainly there is evidence that there were some differences in terms of how some animals were behaving. You know, I think in park areas, when people weren't in those park areas all of a sudden, you could, so for example, Yosemite National Park gets a massive amount of visitation. All of a sudden there were no people. Definitely it seemed like wildlife, coyotes, bears, et cetera, were coming down and using those areas in ways that they weren't before. But in terms of our work, you know, we, we weren't really seeing that. I mean, that the mountain lions already kind of aren't really using the developed areas very much, as I said, right? And a, a lot of people were actually more in their residential areas and at home um, than they were before, right? Because they were all at home. So it was interesting. We, we did an analysis and we're actually working on publishing a, a paper soon of looking specifically at some of the animals where we had data before the shutdown and after the shutdown. And we saw some interesting things. One thing we saw was a little bit counterintuitive, which is that they actually were using less, a smaller amount of area than they were beforehand. Um, and we think that might be for some of these animals like P22 in Griffith Park, for example, there's so many people there, he's having to navigate around people and avoid people when there's tons of people in the park, right? And so, but when, so if he's resting somewhere and people come by, he might have to leave. And so he ends up using a larger area. But when there's no people in the park, he can just sort of do whatever he feels like and, and go wherever he wants and doesn't have to move around as much. Um, so we think in, in that situation, actually, it was a little bit the opposite that the animals could be a little more efficient and did not have to use as much space. Um, but there certainly were cases where, you know, where animals were coming out into areas that people weren't in anymore. Um, so, yeah. Right. All right. Um, another question, are wildland urban interface residential areas considered altered open or natural spaces? Yeah, you know, it's an excellent question. And, you know, there's, um, it, it's something that we struggle with as urban ecologists, right? So at what point is it urban and at what point is it natural and what's in between, you know, you, and you can make, I mean, we, we were often using just three categories, right? Urban, altered, open, and natural, but you could make way more categories. And, and sometimes we have, for example, sometimes we've done some work in some more, in some more um, agricultural areas. And so we split things up into, you know, vineyards and row crops and sort of things like that. So, um, but I would say it kind of depends the answer to the question is, I think it depends on what that residential area is like. So if that residential area that's right next to open space is pretty high density, then we would we would call that urban, right? But if it was very low density, like you see in some of these gated communities, like I was showing the picture of that, we kind of consider that to be more altered open. In other words, it's not exactly developed, but it's not exactly natural either. So I think uh, it, it, urban ecology is really interesting, but also a little bit complex. So yeah, what do you, what do you call urban, you know, and different people do it in different ways and stuff. So, but yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. Um, okay. Do we know the origins of the mange? Um, yeah, so, so that's a really good question. And the truth is, it's so hard to study wildlife disease, right? So basically, we can't find these mites except on animals that are extremely sick. You know what I mean? So, um, and we think, and the, the truth is we've really been trying to, to get at that question um, in other ways. So you can do these tests, you can do serologic tests. Actually, everyone's all from, much more familiar with all these terms than they were a year ago, right? So you can do a serologic test to learn, to see if you've been exposed to a disease, right? So if you have antibodies, just like we've been doing, you know, in the last year with with coronavirus, and but unfortunately, there's not currently 
um, or there hasn't been a serologic test for notoedric mange, right? So one of the things we'd like to do is see, okay, are all the bobcats out there mostly exposed to these mange, but only the ones, which is kind of what we think is the ones that are exposed to these rodenticides, their immune system is weakened and then they're more likely to get sick, right? Um, and so we think there's relatively widespread exposure to the mites, but like I said, unfortunately, you can't find the mites. Um, even though we did, you know, we've done skin scrapings and we've tried, but you know, like we're handling these animals for only 45 minutes and then letting them go, you know what I mean? So, um, so basically if the animal's already really sick, when you already know it has mites, well, then you can find them, you know? So, um, so the answer is, unfortunately, we don't know that much about, um, about where, uh, where the mites are coming from, but we're hoping to learn more. Yeah. Great. So, Emmy, I know that we're at time. There's a, there were another yeah. that came in. I mean, I'm, um, it's up to you all. I'm happy to, you know, answer. Um, maybe questions. one last question. Uh, this was a question from Alejandra. How do you think the high amount of um, anthropogenic food sources is affecting coyote behavior? Yeah. So that's also a really good question. Yeah. I mean, it, um, I think it depends on the source. So, you know, I think if coyotes are, you know, someone's cat is out roaming outside their yard and into, you know, maybe into some natural areas and the coyote, you know, ends up taking that cat, I don't think that's affecting their behavior towards people very much, if that makes sense, right? But right. I think the biggest problem, and unfortunately, this is something we've been really tried to to get to learn more about too and just haven't had the chance yet and there's a lot of opinions about it and not that much data but you know i think one of the big problems potentially is if people are directly feeding animals like coyotes um, and they're getting anthropogenic food items that way then that's going to be more of a problem because then they're going to associate people directly you know if they come along in a park area and there's a trash can and they get food from that trash can they're not going to associate that with directly with people in the same way, right? But if a person is feeding them either in dishes or especially like trying to feed them by hand, you know, I think that's when you start to get more of a change in behavior and especially a behavior that could end up, you know, with the coyote being being killed if it bites someone, et cetera. So. And is that something that you do at the National Park Service, like educating people not to do that kind of? We certainly. Uh, whenever we can. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, it's something we don't know very much, unfortunately, about. It would be nice to know a lot more about. Oh, so, you know, the vast majority of coyotes, as I said, don't get into these conflicts with people, but sometimes they do, obviously. And we just don't know very much about, you know, when that happens, why does it happen? Uh, we were part of a study actually across the whole country to try to look at boldness in coyotes and see if are urban coyotes bolder than non-urban coyotes? And that's something sort of that's ongoing. So that's something getting sort of directly, not quite to that question, but similar idea of like, do we see differences in behavior in more urban, urban animals, so. Well, this was really, really informative. And thank you so much for just sharing this information with us. I never even thought about the, you know, the concept of um, the prey benefiting from the urban resources like our landscaping plants and then that indirectly benefiting our carnivores. That is, I just never thought about that, so. Yeah, that's something that we just have, you know, sort of thought about more recently ourselves. So that's kind of a cool thing, yeah. Yeah, and I'm really excited about the land bridge and seeing that and, and being one of those places to be able to see how this works and, and get them yeah, no, it's it's very exciting. I, I will say that um, I saw a question about, you know, why, how do we decide to put it where it is? Part mm -hmm. of it is there, there just aren't very many options. You know, that there's, you just look at, you, you know, you look at Google Maps or Google Earth or whatever, and you'll see that the, there's almost no, well, no place next to the freeway where there's natural area and even fewer places where it's next to the freeway on both sides, you know, so, yeah. um, so that's part of it, but also north of Liberty Canyon, uh, you, you go through the Simi Hills and you can get all the way to the one place along 118 where you also have that at Rocky Peak between the San Fernando Valley and the and Simi Valley. So um, anyway. Is there a, like a time frame of when it's going to be built? Yeah, so, so that's, that's a good question. So the, the hope is if we stay on 
track with the funding and that's not my, um, you know, that's not what we do. We do the science part, right? But we're involved with the overall project. And actually this challenge grant from Annenberg that just got announced last week for the 25 million is huge. Um, and so if we stay on track funding wise, which now we're a lot more hopeful that we, you know, than we were before last week, basically, um, the plan is to, to break ground late this year, maybe early 2022, which, you know, we've been thinking about this for 20 to 30 years. So, that's you know, so, time. so that seems so, pretty darn soon at this point. It's pretty so exciting. Is it, is it one of those, uh, if they build it, they will come? You know, so will the animals? Um, right. So that's a good question. I saw that in the chat Jill that people were asking that. that. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, we're very confident that they will that they will use it. Um, I mean, we're going to do everything we can to encourage them to use it. Right. So it's very wide. It's 50 meters wide, like 165 feet. Um, and the plan is, it's going to it's going to we're going to put a bunch of soil on top and vegetate it and make it feel as much as possible like like natural area right, right. um and so we're going to you know and like i said it's for the mountain lions but it's for everything as everything else as well we're hoping to get everything from you know lizards and birds and you know salamanders and deer 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 are actually harder to get across you know they won't go in these culverts and stuff so um so we're going to we're going to do it that way but we're also going to do things like put up walls so that to block the um, the light and the noise as much as possible, but also we use so typically not typically you always basically use um, use fencing to keep the animals off the freeway, but also to funnel them towards the crossing. Um, yeah. And so we're certainly going to do that. Um, but the truth is, I would say two things. One is not every animal is going to find it, um, but lots of animals definitely will. And as people were saying. People have seen all over the world as these things have been there for a little while, then animals realize that they're very smart and they find it and they'll use it, uh, use it regularly. So it'll be interesting. I mean, it, you know, we'll, we'll see how we see how long it takes, but some of these crossings that people have put in, like there was one in Utah recently and who like right away, there were bighorn sheep like going across that crossing. And that one was much thinner and didn't have as much, you know, sort of naturally. I mean, part of it too is, as I was saying, there's there's so few places where it's even possible. And so, you know, the one animal that we got that crossed P12, he actually crossed right in the Liberty Canyon area. And, and we, we don't know if he went over the freeway or under Liberty Canyon Road or whatever, but I mean, it, it's not that surprising because there just aren't that many options, you know what I mean? So, so in that sense, the animals are kind of funneled, you know, assuming they don't want to go into the development, you know what I mean? They're funneled even by the landscape to that Liberty Canyon area. And then once they're in the area, the fencing is going to help if that makes sense. So it's going to be a great new aspect to, uh, to your studies, huh? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I really feel like it's just an exciting thing for Southern California. You know, I mean, people 300, 300, 300 or between 300 and 400,000 cars go, you know, go down that stretch every day. And now there's going to be this huge crossing there that the people of Southern California felt was important enough um, to maintain natural areas and main, maintain biodiversity. You know, if, you know, if we can do it here, right? I mean, love it. So. Yeah. Well, thank yeah, you for it's your it's work. Exciting. Yeah, thank you yeah. for your work. I'm really happy that we can end on a positive note because you know when you were sharing some of the <laughs> the graphics and and the, the kink and the tail and stuff and right, you yeah. just get so sad but I'm glad that we're you know um funneling resources to help these our neighbors or you know the organisms that we share share the land okay, with yeah 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 excellent all right well, wow Thank you so much, Dr. Riley. Of We're course, getting a yeah, lot of thank, um, you thank yous in the chat as well. And um, like I said, the recording will be up. I'm probably going to have to watch the recording a few more times to just get all the data pieces. <laughs> I know, um, I go pretty fast. Sorry about that, but yeah, I'm trying to. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah. Um, yeah, there were even some fourth graders here. Oh, good. And That's great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So great, um, 
opportunity to just spread the word and like someone was saying in the chat to just yeah raise awareness yeah all right okay, well, well thank you thank you thank you everyone and, uh, yeah, we'll uh, talk to you soon hopefully yes thanks to everyone and see you next time and again uh, volu come volunteer with tree people all right